Once again, we want to thank you for tuning in to Crossings, a ministry of Calvary Baptist Church. I'm Pastor Dwight Lapine, and I'll be your host this morning as we get started in teaching you what the Bible says, not only about eternal life, but how to get to know God daily, moment by moment, in a personal way. We trust that this connection would really help you have a peace and a joy as you come to know Him and believe in Him. Well, it's good to have you here today, and um, we are going to be looking at 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 17. Our subject and topic today is that which relates to the Word of God. A healthy church is a church that honors the Word of God. This is very significant in our day. Um, one of the most prominent pastors in America just was, was being interviewed, and he said, and I'm not going to quote him as much as I'm going to give you the gist of what he said, that expository preaching basically was no longer valuable in our day. And, and what that simply means is, if you're going to tend to approach Scripture literally, and you're going to tend to approach it historically and contextually, and grammatically, then you're taking a shortcut to preaching and you shouldn't use it. And I was just appalled to hear that because it's a direct attack upon the Word of God. He went on to say that you can't take absolutely everything in Scripture just the way it's written, but needs to be interpreted. And there are whole systems of theology out there that use the allegorical approach to Scripture rather than a literal approach to Scripture. And I just want you to pause for a moment and think about something. Where would you be without your Bible? Where would you be if you didn't have the Bible to read? How would you think? What would your life be like? You wouldn't be here today, would you? Because this is a church that honors the Bible. And if you didn't honor the Bible, you wouldn't be seeking a church that honored the Bible. And the more we see these days heading towards the any moment return of Christ, the more we're going to see waywardness when it comes to the scriptures. Some years ago, Marsha and I were visiting an area in our state that is considered to be the most... Um, vile or wicked inner city in America. You say, was that Chicago? No, it wasn't Chicago. It was down by East St. Louis, a little town next to East St. Louis, and those towns just sort of integrate into each other called Washington Park. We have a church there in Washington Park. And this church needed a pastor, and I began working on that. It took years for me to find somebody that would be interested in going into that church. But while we were down there one time visiting, trying to get somebody to come to the church and trying to work with the church, we drove a distance away, just off the interstate on Highway 64, Interstate 64. And we met at a Cracker Barrel with a black pastor there to have lunch. While we were there from 2 to 3 in the afternoon, our car was robbed. Everything in our car that was in a case was stolen. So all of our clothes were stolen. All of my material for our fellowship was stolen. My display board, my display material, my briefcase, and so forth. Everything that was in a, in a bag. Um, in my briefcase was my Bible. And folks, I don't know, has anybody here had their Bible stolen besides me? Marcia, <laughs> hers was stolen too. You, sir, you did, and you did. Let me ask this, how did it make you feel? Huh? How did it make you feel? It was a spare Bible. I'll tell you, when, this, when my Bible was stolen, I had just put on an $85 leather cover on that Bible that was stolen. 
I had almost every instance of the word if in the New Testament circled and labeled as a first, second, or third class condition of the use of the word if. I had circled almost every conjunction starting a verse and labeled whether it was the conjunction chi for and, therefore showing continuity, or it was de, which is the conjunction that shows contrast with continuity, or whether it was one of the other conjunctions like Allah and so forth. All of that was underlined. I had whole theological structures and outlines on the blank pages of, of my Bible. I had verses and notes underlined, and all of a sudden, it was gone. It was like I lost and I have to be careful how I say this. It was like I lost my best friend. My wife actually is my best friend, you understand, so I had to be careful. But it's like I lost the most precious possession that I could ever have had in my life. And for the first time, I understood that question. What would it be like if you didn't have the Bible? Where would you be if you didn't have the Bible at all? Where would America be? What would this world be like without the Bible? The only reason there's a sense of morality in this world is because of the scriptures. Whether you're looking before Christ and you think of the Jews and they as a people group, a witness to this godless pagan world. And as you read the Old Testament, you find it was a constant fight to try to show the one true God in contrast to all the pagan gods. Or whether you're talking about the basis for which nations have been founded, like America itself, and the fact that biblical principles were used in the founding of this country, the sense of right and wrong, the sense of morality, the Judeo-Christian ethic, are all things that are a result of the Word of God. And without the Word of God, these things would not be in existence the way they are today. Listen to this little poem. I give thanks for my Bible, the precious word of God. It saves and keeps me satisfied along the path I trod. This book has been my companion. Oh, the times it has comforted me. It encourages my heart. It makes me glad. And from sin, it has set me free. Of all the books that I have read, my Bible alone stands tall. Though books I'll have until I die, this book excels them all. So I'll take my Bible wherever I go. It is my constant guide. When friends forsake me and life's hopes fail me, in this book I will continue to reside. Amen? This Bible transcends all eras and relationships in every generation. In the last of the 18th century, the French atheist, infidel, Voltaire, made the prediction that within a hundred years, the Bible and Christianity would be completely forgotten. Voltaire died in 1778. There are billions of copies of the Bible in existence today, and God's church continues to be alive and well. Even though it is an ancient book, the Bible is up to date and completely relevant. The Bible is the world's greatest book. The Bible is the revelatory standard of God for all mankind. I just finished preaching a prophecy conference in the state of Iowa just this last week or so. Yeah, last week, I guess. And... Um, one of the messages was entitled, Where is America at the End? And then another message was, How will the world end? Well, it was on that night that two people trusted Christ as their Savior. Because there's only one book that actually predicts how things are going to end, folks. Only one book. Everybody else can use scare tactics and talk about you know, nuclear attacks and how things are going to end. But the Bible actually chronicles how it's going to end. And it's amazing that in the first three and a half years of the tribulation period, it says that one-fourth of the population of the world is gone, is dead. And then when you get to the trumpet judgments later on in the second half of the tribulation period, 
It indicates that another third of the world's population are killed. And when you add all that up and you think, boy, there's about 8 billion people, we'll just round it off at 7 billion and so many other people, but we'll round it off at 8 billion and you say, well, one-fourth of the world's population in the first three and a half years of the tribulation period, and that's supposed to be the peaceful time? Let's see, one-fourth of 8 billion would be what? 2 billion. 2 billion people eliminated from this earth? In three and a half years? And then when you get to the last half of the tribulation, you're dealing with a trumpet judgment, another third. Well, what's a third of six billion? Two billion. Four billion people in seven years. It's an amazing thing. The Bible goes on record. The Bible states this clearly. That this is the way it's going to happen. You have people that say, well, if I don't trust Christ now, I can always do it then. Listen, you may not be one of the survivors in the tribulation period. You even have the chance to trust Christ. If you've got that many people dying in the tribulation period. And the Bible is the only book that you can trust. It's the only book that has a map that not only tells about the past, but tells also about the future. Let's look at First Thess- or, uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verses 1 through 17. And our first idea is that there are godless deceivers who dishonor God. And that's in the first nine verses. And so we want to de- consider the description of the ungodly that is given here. No, but know this, that in the last days perilous times will come. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderous, without self Control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasures rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power and from such people turn away. It is an amazing description of what we're seeing in our day and in America even today. Just remember that the key problem during the days of Noah was violence. Violence. The wickedness of man was so rampant upon the earth that God was coming to the place of wondering why he created man if they were going to be that violent. And what kind of a culture and society do we have today? We have a violent culture. We talked about that a little bit last night when we talked about the fact that in Chicago we have these murders going on in Kankakee. Marsha picked up something from the news in Kankakee, Illinois. There were uh, five murders in 36 hours. And Kankakee isn't that big of a city. And you you can chronicle those kinds of things all over our country. Listen, do you ever see what they're advertising on TV regarding these video games? These video games that are out there, they're, they're just violent games. I just uh, been reading an article from Time Magazine. I, I get that magazine, and back uh, probably a month ago or so, it, it had an article about the Internet, and it said, what had started out to be simply a way of communicating information has now become a violent means of targeting people worldwide. And they call these people trolls, and they're definitely and deliberately on the Internet to humiliate people and to expose people and to make fun of people and to make death threats on people and some of the people they have given death threats to have now stopped tw- their Twitter accounts and some of them have stopped uh, even using their email accounts because of the death threats that are coming and these people are laughing their way. They talk about this in terms of having a great laugh and this thing is expanding. This thing is not getting smaller. This is expanding. Things are out of control in the world today and there are these 18 expressions of sinful living that we see here and you see that the main problem is misplaced love for they are selfish lovers, verse 2. They are shameful lovers, verse 3. And they are sensual lovers, verse 4. And then it says in our verse, verse 5, that they are people who are focusing on the external. They have a form of godliness, but they deny the inward values that are really the reality of character and morals in life. We are becoming shallow and more shallow in our cultures around this world. 
we are more fascinated with things often than we are with God. We're more duped by pleasure than any time in our history. America uses more oil than any nation in the world. I think right now it comes out to a thousand barrels per second. A thousand barrels of oil per second used in the United States. Why? Because we're geared to pleasure and things and driving and cars and other ways in which we use oil. It's fascinating that if the oil were to stop, it would absolutely cripple America if it were to stop. If there were to be a shortage, absolutely cripple us. We were just in Colorado. We lived there for many years. And that's where we had our church plant and the Lord blessed for 33 years in that ministry. And we just drove out there just a month ago or so. We drove the Peak to Peak Highway. The Peak to Peak Highway is just outside of Denver. And you go up towards Black Hawk and Central City, which is now a mecca gambling place fueled by Las Vegas money. And then you drive and through those mountains and through those uh, highways up there. And it's, it's all, again, fairly close to the Denver area up there. But it's still 20 to 30 miles away. And you finally end up up above Boulder and then you come back down Boulder Canyon you come into the Boulder area and then you're back about 25 miles from Denver and as we drove up there I kept asking these questions look at all these houses up here look at these housing developments and so forth and I said to the person that was driving us I said uh, where do these people work he says well they all work in Denver and I said you mean they drive 30 miles 40 miles every day to work oh yeah yeah that's their choice to live in isolation and drive and I just said to him because I've been dealing with this prophecy stuff lately and I I just said to him what's going to happen if the oil stops what's going to happen if they can't get fuel for their cars and they can't make that daily trip we are in a place of vulnerability that we have not been in and that almost any country has not been in with our dependence upon things and so we've got this description of the ungodly in verses 1 through 5 and we have the deception of the ungodly in verses 6 through 9 their folly is going to be manifest to all it says for of this sort are those who creep into households and make captives of gullible women loaded down with sins I, I, I just can't get over the way that is phrased in that verse where it talks about women loaded down with sins led away by various lusts always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth now as Janus and Jambres received resisted Moses so do these also resist the truth men of corrupt minds disapprove concerning the faith but they will progress no further for their folly will be manifest to all as theirs also was the deception sanctions sinful lifestyles as we see in verse 6 loaded down with sin deception thrives on intellectual seekers who never come to the knowledge of the truth and we have those in our day calling themselves scientists who hold to macroevolution. And they feel that that can be the answer for origins, but they lack a consistent ability to prove their thesis and have no answer for the ultimate cause of all things. For if you ever talk to a person who has this position and you ask them about ultimate cause, they always start with something. They start with the universe. They start with an amoeba. They talk about some type of uh, small primitive life forms in a chemical substance sort of called a primordial ooze and they somehow get together and from that they're able to somehow connect and develop and you say to them listen you've started with something and if you've started with something that's always a result 
That is never a cause. If you can experience it with your senses, if you can see it, feel it, taste it, touch it, it's a result. It's not a cause. What's your cause? Your cause cannot be material. Your, your cause cannot be something that I can see or touch or that is material in substance. It has to be greater. It has to be beyond something that is material. What's your cause? And so they seek the truth. They, they are ever wanting to learn, but they miss the truth. Stephen Hawking is considered one of the great minds that we have in our day. Stephen Hawking is a theoretical physicist and cosmologist at Cambridge University. Is a man that deals daily with a debilitating disease to where he has to have special help just to exist. He, he has said this, the human race is just a chemical scum on a moderate-sized planet orbiting around a very average star in the outer suburb of among a hundred billion galaxies. Anybody want to adopt his view of the origins of life? You don't like being called scum? That's how the unsaved view origins and life have very little appreciation for what God calls life and the sanctity of life. Second Peter chapter 3 and verse 3. Why don't we turn to Second Peter chapter 3 and verse 3 for just a moment. It is interesting how Second Peter 3 describes some of these that deny. And it is interesting how it, it says that they are willful in their denial. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 3. It says, Knowing this first, that scoffers will come in the last days, walking according to their own lusts. And never forget the final wording of that verse. The reason that they are scoffers to begin with is that they're walking according to their own lusts. And they say, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. That's a lie. That is what is called uniformitarianism. Uniformitarianism says there's been no strategic outside event that's ever impacted the world. And the answer to that is there has too been an outstanding extra earthly event that came and it's called the flood. The flood was supernatural. And it came upon this earth and it affected earth. It affected everything about the earth. And so they say nothing has ever changed it's all been the same and for this verse 5 they willfully forget they willfully forget and what's interesting is the bible is so strategic that in this chapter you have the five systems of heaven and earth the five systems that are making up all of human history are right here in chapter 3 you have the beginning of creation, verses 4 and 5. You have the section here in verse 6 that is labeled before the flood. And in the next verse you have after the flood, verse 7. And then in verse 7 you see the reference to fire and judgment. And then you look at verses 10 and following and you see the fire and judgment that is yet to come. And then you have the new heavens and the new earth in verse 13. And so you have... Five strategic, dynamic systems all chronicled in one chapter of the Bible that shows not only the past, but the entire future. And those that are ungodly deny it. They have no real ability to learn because they have denied the one who made all things. I want you to notice our second idea, and that's our final thought, and that is there are godly disciplines which honor God's word. I want you to turn back to 2 Timothy chapter 3 and notice that the godly are faithful to God's word, verses 10 through 13. But we have carefully followed, but you have carefully followed my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long suffering, love, perseverance, persecutions, afflictions, which happened to me at Antioch and Iconium and at Lystra. 
what persecutions I endured, and out of them all the Lord delivered me. Paul says, I have also been a, an example, and you have followed the example of my performance, and even through my persecutions. And then he says, I want to give you a prediction. All who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. I can't help but think that it's on its way to America, folks. I just see what's going on in the world today, the hatred that exists, the barbaric examples from people that do not worship the one true God. And I think they are infiltrating America. And if they ever have a unified plan, they could create universal chaos in America all on the same day. I am personally telling the churches that are under my responsibility in Illinois, Missouri, and it involves not only the JRB churches, but some independent churches, I am saying to them, you are a target. And any time there's a group of Christians meeting together, they are a target. You better plan. You better prepare. You better take measures. And so I'm saying to all of our churches, you ought to encourage concealed carry. There ought to be somebody in your church, any time you meet, that is concealed carry. I'm telling our churches, lock your front door after your service starts. Lock your doors. Have an usher in the foyer to let in latecomers. But lock your doors. You say, why? Because in Illinois, after a preacher started preaching, a man walked right down the center aisle and everybody in the church thought it was part of his message. He took out a gun and shot the, the pastor in the pulpit. Shot him. Dead in the pulpit. Marsha and I were visiting one of our preacher boys in Indiana. I was coming home from a, a conference just here two months ago, and we visited one of our preacher boys in the church. He has now got his entire security organized in his church. They lock the doors. They have numerous men that carry. And after the service started, this man came out from somewhere in the church. He had come in previously. He came in with a backpack. He walked all the way down to the front row. He put his backpack down, and the first thing he did was stretch. And that's a sign. That's a sign. But because the church was prepared, two of the men immediately got up, went over, sat next to him. The one man talked to him and said, we're glad to have you here today. The other man grabbed his backpack and they said, we're glad you're here today, but we do need to talk with you. And they ushered him out of the auditorium and called the police and the police then took care of it. He was ready to blow the church up. A 12-year-old boy walks into a wedding reception in Turkey. A 12-year-old boy and blows himself up killing 50 people and injuring scores of others. And I've said to some of our pastors, how would you welcome a 12-year-old boy into your church? You would likely go to the door and say, hi, son, how are you? Glad to see you here. Are your parents here? No, they're not. You came by yourself. Well, praise the Lord. You know, we have a wonderful class for you. We're so glad you're here. None of us would suspect a 12-year-old boy. But wherever Christians are going to gather, they are going to become a target. And persecution could come to America. And so Paul predicts the possibility of persecution. Notice the godly are fashioned by God's word, verses 14 through 17. The word of God thoroughly examines the godly. Examination is important for faithful steps. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. It is interesting in the original language that if there is a definite article, then it's absolutely pinpointing and specifying something that exists. 
And when the Greek does not use a definite article, it is called the anarthrous construction. And when the anarthrous construction is used, it simply points to the character and the quality of the noun. And here in this passage, it is an arthrus. It is not the use of the definite article. It is, simply, it is not all the scripture. Because if it said all the scripture, it would be pointing to the scripture that was already written and would not allow for any of the scripture that was to come later. And what is the scriptures that would come later? All the writings of John, possibly, then 90 AD would have been those that would have come later. Some of the ones that Paul wrote might not have been circulated around and identified as scripture. Scripture. And so it is not saying all the scripture that is now in existence. It's saying anything that has the quality and the character of scripture revelatory information from God is profitable. And it is profitable because scripture examines us. Scripture scrutinizes us. And so it is an examination that is important for faithful steps. Now I'm going to go through this quickly and, and you may, I don't think it's in your outline, you may want to write it down and the first one is the faithful steps folks, so you might want to write that down. It is the examination and crucial for faithful steps and being rooted it says it is profitable for doctrine that is important for forward steps forward steps, doing what is right, and to continue in that truth and in that teaching. And then it says it is profitable for reproof. That is important for false steps. False steps. We have a tendency to step aside, to step away, to, to take divergent has from time to time and the word of God is what brings us back it is important it says also and profitable for correction and correction is important for faltering steps it's faltering steps and correction says you stepped aside now we want to show you how to get right how to bring what you just did back into the the scope of the word of God it says it is that which is instructive for righteousness. And the idea here is child training. And so we say it's important for, for first steps. For first steps. The steps that are sequential and the steps that are important one after another that are going to lead you into maturity. And then, of course, it says that the man of God might be thoroughly equipped and that's verse 17, and the equipping is important for future steps. Future steps. We don't know what the future is, but aren't you glad we worship a God who does know everything about our future? We have a hard time remembering the past, and our present is a little confused, <laughs> and we don't know anything about the future. Aren't we glad that God does? God knows. And so whether we're talking about faithful steps, forward steps, false steps, faltering steps, first steps, or future steps, the Word of God is the key. And it can meet you where you are. And it can say, here's the answer. You don't have to look somewhere else. Here's the truth. So interesting that in Acts chapter 2, when the early church was formed it said they continued steadfastly in what doctrine doctrine and that's the first thing that's mentioned here the word of god is profitable for doctrine so it involves perfect equipping perfect equipping it is fitted it is literally equipping us or fitted to meet our needs and that takes in the faithful forward and first steps of an individual. And it is involved with personal equipping. It says thoroughly equipped. And that is a word that means to fit out a joint or to set it in place. And that takes care of those steps that were false or faltering. For sometimes we get out of joint and need to be 
fitted back into joint. And then it involves a productive equipping. It says in every good work. And that's the future steps. The future steps. I'll never forget when I understood Ephesians 2.10 where it says that we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus under what? Good works. And it talks about the fact which were foreordained or before determined that we might walk in them. We are God's poem. We are God's beautiful expression of rhyme and reason and truth, beautifully expressed. That's the word poema, which is workman, workmanship. We are God's poema, his poem. That's where we get our English word poem. We are God's poem, and we are then equipped to walk in the works that he has foreordained for us. And the reason that made a difference in my life is because it, it changed my perspective. Instead of getting up every day and saying, well, I think I'm going to serve the Lord this way, and I think I'm going to serve the Lord this way, and I've got a good idea over here, and I think I'm going to try this, and I might even take a track, and I'm just going to go out and hand it to somebody. And instead of me coming up with what I wanted to do that day, my whole perspective changed to say, dear God, what have you already ordained for me to do today? What are the good works that you've already planned for me to be doing today? Because I just simply want to know what they are so I can walk in them. I don't want to walk the way I want to walk. I don't want to do the works that I think I should do simply because I thought of them. I simply want to do what you want me to do. Amen? God is organized, folks. And he's organized to the daily routines of your life. Don't neglect them. Stay open. Stay pliable. Be willing to be led every day. And get up every day to just simply say, Dear Lord, how do you want me to live for you today? How do you want me to walk in your ways today? In the later years of my dad's ministry, and it was later because... I remember when he told me that's what he did. And it was later on. It wasn't his whole life. He took that verse out of Psalm 118. This is the day that the Lord has made. I will be glad and rejoice in it. And even though he knew the interpretation was for a future day, millennial in scope, he just simply applied it to his life. And so, you know, you can do that. If you want to just apply, you can, you can be reckless, we'll say. So he just decided, I'm going to take that verse, and I, every time I get up in the morning, the first thing I'm going to say, this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. And that was his perspective from that day forward. Every day, Lord, you've given me breath. You didn't take me home in the middle of the night. You kept my heart beating. Evidently, you want me to live another day. If you want me to live another day, help me to be a man of your word and help me to live and function in light of your will and the works that you have created for me to do. So it's challenging in, in its effort. It's every and it's consecrating in its effect. They are good and it is comprehensive in its extent. It is work, his work. I close with this. This book reveals the mind of God, the state of man, the way of salvation, the doom of sinners, and the happiness of believers. Its doctrines are holy, its precepts are binding, its histories are true, and its decisions are immutable. Read it to be wise, believe it to be saved, and practice it to be holy. It contains light to direct you, food to support you, and comfort to cheer you. It is a traveler's map, the pilgrim's staff, the pilot's compass, the soldier's sword, and the Christian's charter. 
Jesus is its grand subject, our good, its design, and the glory of God, its end. It should fill the memory, rule the heart, and guide the feet. Read it slowly, read it frequently, read it prayerfully. It is a mine of wealth, a paradise of glory, and a river of pleasure. It is given to you in life. It will be opened at the judgment. It will be remembered forever. It involves highest responsibility. It will reward the greatest labor and condemn all who trifle with its sacred contents. Owned, it is riches. Studied, it is wisdom. Trusted, it is salvation. Loved, it is character. And obeyed, it is is powerful. The Word of God. You know, a healthy church are people who are people of the Word of God. Let's bow for prayer. Our Father, we're thankful for this insight into your Word once again. This passage of Scripture that is so enlightening about the difference between the godly and the ungodly. And while the ungodly spurn the truth and live for themselves, as we're seeing in our own day and culture, a day and culture that is described by selfies and meism, it is so refreshing to see a passage of Scripture that says that is not profitable. What is profitable is the Word of God. And it's profitable for doctrine and for reproof and for correction and for instruction in righteousness that the man of God, the believer, the person who's placed his faith and trust in you might be thoroughly equipped unto every good work. May that be true of everyone in this congregation today. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Once again, we want to thank you for tuning into our program. It's been a delight to have you. I trust that you understand a little bit more about what Jesus Christ did for you when he died on the cross. Salvation is not something that you receive because you're born into a family or because you go to church or because you're good. Salvation is a free gift, but that gift has to be received. If you have not received it, we'd like to have you take some time to talk to God and ask him that he might be your savior. You understand that you are a sinner, that Jesus Christ died for you, that you can know that you have eternal life by putting your trust in Christ today.